Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and I'm coming at you from a slightly different viewing angle than normal because I don't want to hold this big thing up. This is the Lampazator Amber 3 Digital to Analog Converter. This was loaned to me by a friend of the channel who bought it used and then had it sent here. That friend of the channel is Lo Fiden. He is starting a YouTube channel, which I will link to down below. So please check out his channel and give him a thank you for loaning me this unit here. Now, this is a little bit interesting because uh, this is not the most recent version of the Amber line from Lam Lampazator. Okay, so uh, the Amber 4 is the most up-to-date model, uh, but I think you can still buy the Amber 3 new because I went to Lampazator's North America website. They had Amber 3 as an option in there, and uh, they, were, they allowed me to add it to the cart, so to the folks at Lampazator. Uh, sorry for putting it in the cart and then removing it and getting your hopes up that way, but uh, I uh, just needed to be sure if you could actually still buy it. And you may or may not want to do that because this Amber 3 here does sound really good. Uh, I have a lot of really good things to say about it here in a moment. But the Lam Lampazator Amber 4 is still hanging out out there uh, at the same price. So the brand new price for these is 4385 US dollars. Um, and that is curious because the Amber line is Lampazator's intro line. That is their in entry level series. And so they are a high end company, at least in terms of their DAX. And then they just go way up to stratospheric prices okay, um, in their, their digital to analog converter line. So the sound impressions that I'm going to give you are for the Amber 3. And I should also say that, event that sometimes these pop up used. Hi-Fi Shark says that the uh, the latest two used prices for this have been 25 and 2600 US dollars. And if you can score it for that price, good on you. There's a lot of value here at that price. But because this is no longer the most recent unit and the Amber 4 is out there, then we need to consider this review more as like, let's talk about the Lampazator House sound and how this entry level series like gets you into it and whether or not the overall sound and presentation here is something worth considering. Okay, uh, because their website does say that other than the physical build and the operation of the unit, which from their website, that's the best I can gather, is the same as this one. They say they have redesigned the, uh, the Amber 4 inside. So this is going to be a little bit different in a review because of that. Uh, and so we will get into my impressions of the Amber 3, what I think that means for the Amber 4, and what kind of a sound you're getting out of these units. And to, as so you can make a judgment as to whether or not this would be something you are interested in learning more about. So that was a little longer intro than usual because there's some important ground to cover there. So we'll do shameless self-promotion. We'll come back on the other side and we'll get into all of those things I just said. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Please remember to hit that like button, and if you haven't, please subscribe. Also, I have a Patreon set up so that you can help support me on a monthly basis, and I've set up a PayPal donation so that you can help me out in that way too if a monthly dis a subscription does not make sense for you. Links for all of that, including the benefits, in the description below. Please check those out. All right, on with the show. All right, now, Again, this is going to be different for reasons I just described before, a shameless self-promotion. Um, I do also want to say here that what I'm going to do next, because this is a big and heavy unit, it's going to sit on this table, and that's why this looks different than my normal format here. Um, I would, took my phone off the stand, and I moved it around this thing to do a unit tour, and then there was also a really nice folder with some literature in it about the Amber 3. When you buy this unit, it comes with it that I will show you too. And so it was easiest to do handheld phone there, and I tried not to shake it around too much. So that's going to be the next two clips that you see here. And then we'll come back on the other hand, uh, side of that and I will talk about the uh, source gear and the downstream gear, the amps and the headphones and the speakers and all that that I used to, to uh, test this with. And then I will talk about the sound and then we'll wrap it up after that. So let's get into all of those things. All right, so when you open up the box with this Amber 3 in it, you are greeted with what is a high-end experience, really, because it comes with this lovely folder here with the raised Lampazator lettering on it. And let's just take a quick look inside at what's in here. And this will be of important note here 
in a moment when I show you the, uh, do a unit tour because there is a button on the front panel, get a closer look at this, of the DAC, which can be configured at the factory to have multiple different settings. Okay, so that's what's going on here. The one that I have activates the USB, like it switches between the USB input and the SPDIF inputs. Okay, a well done little flyer here for one of their other products. And then this like very nice glossy information card, okay, which gives you a bunch of different information. I won't hold this here for too long. I'll just let you pause that and watch that. I'll read that on your own. Same here with all of the specs, okay? So this is a tube-based DAC, all there. It will do PCM files up to 300, or uh, actually it says right there, up to 768 kilohertz via the USB input as well as DSD and all of that stuff. And it will do up to, I believe, 192 kilohertz sampling rates via its SPDIF inputs and so forth. So, <clears throat> yeah, really high-end experience in here. Then you get this page here that talks about all of the specifics of the unit in your possession. Okay, right there, which is cool. That one's a single-sided document there. And then you get this really nice, fancy... owner card okay nice material looks great you can see this one was manufactured april 6th 2020 and so forth okay i thought that was worth showing you just to let you know that yeah you are being treated treated to a red carpet like experience okay uh when you pick up one of these all right on with the show Going handheld again to do a unit tour, I will try not to shake the phone around too much here. So, very Spartan front panel here. This is the ring button right here in the center, and it has two settings. It has an outer setting here, and then you push it in and it has an inner setting. And this is configurable to either switch between USB and SPDIF input, as this unit is configured to do, or you can cycle power here, or there's another option that is escaping me at the moment, but I showed you on that page earlier in the folder with all of the papers in it. So um, that's what that is right there. So just keep in mind, and, and as far as I can tell, this is still true on the latest Amber model, the Amber 4, is that this ring button here does similar function stuff okay, in there that you've got to select from the manufacturer when you buy it. All right, top of the unit, we can get kind of a look in there, see some of the caps and the tubes and all of that sort of thing uh, on the inside. There's a nice red light that glows out from there when this is powered on that looks pretty cool. But I mean, aluminum otherwise, okay. Just quick look at the side panels here not really much to see there excuse my hand or all of that okay let me uh, pause this and show you the back panel okay derriere all right configurable voltage for use around the world we have the master power switch here okay power input and that sort of thing okay over here, it's interesting. So we see several different input options. First of all, this is the single-ended configuration. You can order this balanced output if you want, but this one is clearly single-ended. We do have a gain selector switch on this, and boy, there's quite a bit of gain when you set it on high. This can get very hot in its output there. Hot in terms of level, not necessarily sharpness or anything like that. Then we see this uh, SPDIF selector here. Okay, uh, so do you want to use, like, which of these SPDIF inputs do you want to activate is selected by this switch right here, and then we have the USB input. So, you, my understanding here, and this was sort of true in practice, is um, you've got to choose which of these three SPDIF inputs you want to use. You've got Toslink Optical here, you've got RCA Coax, you have BNC Coax, right? And so this switch right here tells you which of these you're going to be using. And then the ring button on the front on this unit switches between the USB and the SPDIF. So really you're limited to two digital sources to use on this. And it's kind of a set it and forget it thing because of the presence of this switch on the back. 
unless you uh, are able to configure this in your rack somehow where it's easy to reach around and hit this, uh, this toggle switch here. Amonero USB implementation here. And honestly, I do recommend using the USB over the SPDIF. There was a noticeable improvement in sound quality, clarity, detail retrieval, staging accuracy, like positional accuracy and all of that from the USB input. This is where this unit is at its best. Best I can tell, the Amber 4 is still configured in the same way on, on this one. So if you're going to buy a brand new Amber and get the 4, it works similarly in the input and output there. In the future, I would love to see uh, Lampazator put an I2S option on here, maybe even in place of USB. And that's just because I just get a little bit nervous about plugging USB directly into a computer. Now there are streamers with USB outputs and all of that that help with that, but uh, I just think that options open up moving forward if we had an I2S option in there so you could still get DSD, high bit rate, uh, high sampling rate PCM, and all of that going through I2S and just not have to worry about just the challenges that come with USB generally. All right, but that is the unit tour here. Let me come back on camera and we'll talk about sound. Okay, sound. Let's uh, start the sound by getting into the test gear as uh, we normally do around here. So I sourced this thing primarily in two ways here. I checked the SPDIF inputs. Uh, you put using a Singer SU2 at first and then an SU6, which I got in while this was here. Um, a DDCs uh, in between there. And then I also source this via USB from two sources. One would be my Ultra Rendu um, streamer from Sonor and uh, co connect a direct USB into this. And then I also picked up a Cord 2U D uh, DDC here along the way, which has a switchable output from USB-A to uh, a couple of flavors of coax output. And so I used the USB output of that um, into here, into this one's USB input, and then the USB input of the 2U from my desktop PC. Okay, music files like the uh, the sourcing end of it would have been Rune playing lossless flack and local DSD files or streaming lossless flack from Kobas right uh, through here. Then downstream, the three main amplifiers that I used to pair this with would be my trusty Vioelectric HPA V281, the uh, uh, LTA MZ3, which I have in for review, and that review should be coming up relatively soon. And then I also uh, recently got in a head amp GSX Mini, and so that was used here uh, as well, using the single-ended inputs on all of those because this unit only has a single-ended output. Headphones that I would have used, Hi-Fi-Man Susvara, hi fi HE-1000SE, and HE-1000V2 Stealth Magnet Edition, Focal Utopia Original, and the Rosin Rad Zero that I reviewed relatively recently was also in on some of these signal chains in there, but that's where I did the bulk of my my testing. I do have a set of speakers on my desktop. Those are the Yamo C93 Mark II, which would have been powered by the MZ3, sometimes sourcing this there. And then uh, that system is also connected to kind of a, a chimera of a head uh, of a subwoofer these days. It started out as a Polk PSW505, the amplifier in it died, and I picked up like a cheap fuzzy audio or something like that sub amp that handles the low end duties for that system. I am primarily a headphone user there, so most of the evaluation here was done using headphones, though I will comment on what this did for that simple speaker setup or, or you know, more low end mid fi level kind of uh, speaker setup here in a moment too. So the sound, what does this thing sound like? Uh, robust <laughs> comes to mind. The perceived frequency response here is leaning towards the warm side and the presentation is a little bit thicker and it is both laid back and also very aggressive. So let me uh, uh, unpack all of that here to, um, to a, a larger degree. So. A perceived frequency response here, there is a lot of warmth and low-end heft. 
There is some sparkle up top, but it is not particularly bright. It has enough brightness up top to still have enough edge and definition to it to uh, nail a lot of the spatial and instrument timbre stuff that can help with just a little bit of sparkle. So it has enough of that with ever, without ever sounding overly bright or harsh or edgy in the treble either. And then the mid-range is just really smooth and natural and well tonally balanced. I really did not pick up any kind of mid-range forwardness or anything. It's just very neutral through the mids. But there is a lot of heft and fullness to the low end here. There's a lot of warmth and there is a lot of low end grunt going on here that I think is above neutral at least what would be determined by like say a Harman curve neutral and all of that um, coming in the, the base here. So that's at least from a frequency response standpoint that's the star of the show is that low end heft and presence going on here. Now presentation wise I said that it is both laid back and aggressive. Through the mids and the highs, it's pretty smooth and laid back to my ear. But that low end heft that I mentioned and that low end uh, presence that is there comes with a lot of physicality. There is a lot of slam. It is quite aggressive down low. It really rumbles. It really slams. It really hits hard in that low end. So if you are a bass head that is looking to up the bass performance of your system at the source end, the Amber series here, at least to my ears through the Amber 3, excellent option for you to consider. Okay, and so um, that presentation there, um, actually I should talk about the resolution here first. The, it is a very resolving DAC too. It is not particularly incisive because of that warmer, thicker sound. The detail presentation minus that bass physicality and heft is a little bit more laid back and smooth and relaxed in its presentation. Most of the details in the signal that say my Berkeley Alpha Series 2, which is a very neutral, very incisive DAC that presents a lot of the details very clearly. It's not forward, but it's just very clear. And like, here are the details. Here is everything in your music. This is not quite as incisive or as detail forward as that is. But it's not super far behind. Again, it's more relaxed and smooth, except for the lowest regions where a lot of texturing and all of that comes out too because of that extra low end presence and physicality brings out a lot of that too there in the low end. But in terms of raw detail retrieval ability, I would peg this somewhere between my Chord Hugo 2 and my Berkeley Alpha Series 2. It falls between those two in price and it falls between those two in its detail retrieval uh, in terms of just the raw ability to pull out details from the music. The spatial presentation is also very holographic here. There's very good lateral imaging and separation. There's a good sense of depth and layering, which again, to my ear, falls between my Chord Hugo 2 and my Berkeley Alpha Series 2 in its ability to do those things. And again, it's priced between those two at about the halfway point. I would say it's about the halfway point in between those two in its ability to do that. Okay, so that does mean very, very good. Okay, sounds quite holographic there. The timbre is also very lush and smooth and natural sounding to my ear. So you combine the excellent tonal balance through the mids and the highs in particular here, along with a good sense of the timing, time domain aspects like attack and decay, and you get quite natural timbre uh, going on with this DAC as well. And so uh, it really puts together an excellent sonic presentation that is fun and thumping in the low end. So it's like a bass heads take note there, but then very smooth and natural through the mids and the highs with great spatial presentation and all of that. It's just really an excellent sonic package there. Some things you need to take note on about that though. Okay. It's warmth, it's fullness, it's slamminess, and all of that in the low end. It is pairing picky, which is not rare for um, pieces of audio gear that are getting up into this price range here. It did not match particularly well to my Vioelectric HP uh, AV281 amplifier, okay, or headphone amp. The V281, which I have a sort of review of, which I will link to down below, along with my Berkeley and my Cord and those things. So you'll find links to reviews down in the description of those two. 
Okay, the, the warmth and the fullness here does what that Vioelectric amp, the V281, already does, and it can be a little bit too warm, too thick, too slammy in the low end there. So that's one problem of, of that pairing. Then the next problem with that is that some harshness and some upper mid lower treble grain came out when these two, those two were put together that I haven't really heard before. So just for whatever reason, and it's very rare to hear um, something with my Vio not get along very well to this level, but just for whatever reason, some, some treble harshness and, and some upper mid range grit and grain that is not normally there with the Vio came through when this one was plugged into it. So I don't know if it's just the Vio or if it's just generally because of the warm, thick and aggressive low end presentation of the Amber 3, it's probably smart to avoid doubling down on that with a warmer, thicker and bass aggressive amplifier like the Vio V200 series, for example. Now, the MZ3 and the GSX Mini both sounded fantastic with the Amber 3 as a DAC. Both the GSX Mini and the MZ3, and I will review the MZ3 soon. I have reviewed the uh, Mini a long time ago in written form, which I will link to below. And now that I have one again, I will do a YouTube video of it here in the not distant future. A lot of stuff in, I will get to it when I can. But both of those amplifiers are a little bit more either, um, are a little bit either brighter, okay, as is the case with the Mini, or maybe just a little bit more mid forward with the case, as is the case of the MZ3. But neither of them are super hefty or thick or slammy in the low end. And so the hefty, thick, slammy low end of the Amber 3 here fills out the low end of the MZ3 and the Mini here. And so where those two amplifiers are comparatively weak, they're not poor, but they're just comparatively lower in that area than other amplifiers are, this really fills that out for them. And then they are also like, at least in, especially in case of the Mini, is it's a little bit narrower in stage. This one, the size of the sound stage and all of that opens things up a little bit more on the Mini. Excellent pairing. The MZ3, also very holographic, not quite as narrow as the Mini. So you still get a big sound stage there, but it does need that extra help in the low end to my ear. This really helps fill that out and is an excellent pairing there. So. That's the thing that you have to watch out for with this DAC here. It sounds wonderful, but it is not neutral in its overall presentation, particularly because of that warmth and low end heft. And that does mean that pairing it with amplifiers is something that you need to take care with. And I've given some examples of both the good and the bad there here. Now, I did say I would mention the speaker performance here. Um, this really raised the level of my speaker performance there. Um, on my desk, at least in terms of that low end. And this is like where I really uh, first noticed that that low end heft was coming in here. So the MZ3 was powering those Yamo speakers and the MZ3 is a huge upgrade over uh, the Parasound Zamp V3 that I normally use as my desktop speaker amp. Okay, much more holographic and all of that. Um, using this DAC here, the overall spatial holography and all of that stayed about the same because like, you know, using my Berkeley DAC and all that, this is not overall better than my Ber Berkeley DAC, not quite as resolving, but it has a very different sound to it. Okay. But my subwoofer in that speaker setup, which was, you know, dialed in with my Berkeley DAC as the, the primary source there just started rumbling and slamming and shaking the entire room when this thing was plugged in. So that told me right away that, whoa, there is some more um, low end presence on this thing. Okay, so just keep that in mind that if you're a two channel user and your subs are set up for one thing, you drop this in there, you might wanna drop that subwoofer level down just a little bit. All right, um, finally, like the gain switch on the back here, I find to be uh, rather handy. Uh, if uh, it is quite a bit of difference in level, I put this in on high gain here and it was just blasting everything out. And so I ended up running it in low gain most of the time when it was in my system there. Now, the last thought that I will drop here is like, I mentioned that it's important pairing it with different amplifiers. 
headphones that I have found here, like it really um, doesn't have a huge impact so much on the performance of some headphones. Like it, I like the, the, the amp headphone relationship tends to be a little bit more uh, important here, but I will say that in particular, this thing through the MZ3 and into the Focal Utopia just sounds amazing. Like that is just an amazing combo. And likewise, this thing plus the MZ3 plus the HE1000 SE, just also just incredible. The Susvara is a little bit too much for the MZ3. So that one didn't react quite as well, but again, mostly because of the MZ3 and not because of this. If you have an amp that, ha that handles Susvara well, that this pairs well with, I see no reason why this would at all ever be a problem. Okay, so um, comparisons then. I've kind of woven a couple in, like the, the comparisons that I can give you here in the high end, I've kind of already stated, like my Cord Hugo 2 and Berkeley Alpha Series 2. This falls in the middle of those, almost in the middle of them in terms of both price and then also of performance. So it's appropriately priced with brand new prices there. Um, at least in terms of things like resolution and accuracy of the spatial presentation and all of that. Okay, good job there. Another DAC that I have in that's going to be getting a review very soon is the, I'm pretty sure it's pronounced device, DAC 204. Okay, um, that this is just slightly more resolving than that. That one is also, again, a little bit more neutral in its tuning, although I think it's just a slight, slight V shape to it, which I will unpack further in that review. Okay, but that's a, a 28 almost $2,900 DAC, and this one is a little bit more resolving yet and a little bit more accurate in its spatial presentation than that one is. So overall, really like the Sonic package here. If it's connected to and paired with the right kind of amplifier to go along with the presentation that it offers. And then also keep in mind that you're basically limited to two digital sources on this one. You get USB, which this thing does sound noticeably better from than SPDIF. And then you get one SPDIF input active at a time. Okay, even though there are three types of the Toast Link and then BNC and RCA coax there, but you have to toggle between those with a switch on the back. So basically, you're kind of limited to two, two uh, digital sources at once, which for me as a reviewer can be a little bit frustrating because I'm evaluating stuff all the time and the more the inputs, the better because I can try different things much more easily. But I think for most real world listeners and real world systems, that is likely going to be enough. But if it's not for your system, that is something that you should be aware of. But this has really got me keen on investigating more of the Lampazator house sound. I realize the Amber 4 is out there now, and Lampazator claims that they have reworked the innards of that one from the ground up. Okay, so I'm curious to hear that one, but also like to go higher up in their line because what this does, I really like its sonic presentation when it's matched with, you know, a, a, a lighter, thinner, brighter kind of sounding amp. That just sounds really, really good. I, as a listener, have tended to go with a really neutral, incisive DAC and then a warmer, smoother, um, and like slammier kind of amp, which is why I have really liked the Berkeley or the Chord paired with the Vio V281. But it's perfectly legitimate to go the other way and have the warmer, smoother DAC into a more neutral and incisive amplifier. And this has convinced me that that approach can be absolutely just as valid and as good, uh, of course as valid, but just as good as the incisive DAC okay, and um, the warm amp combination just to go the other way. And so I'm keen to try out more of these. And it's got me turning the gears of like, how can I someday get a warm, smooth, slammy DAC in here like this one that is competing with my Berkeley in terms of its resolution. Okay? It's something that I will look into in the future as well. But it has woken me up to that as a realistic possibility moving forward in a way that others have not done yet before. So I really liked this. I am keen to check out more um, Lampazator products. If you like the, the, what I have described here and get one of these used at that $25, $2,600 price point, that is a phenomenal deal okay? um, if it has the connections and all of that that you're looking for as well. But I will go ahead and leave it there. I am Wave Theory. This has been my review of the Lampazator Amber 3 and just kind of some of my general thoughts on like the Lampazator Amber series, which is their entry-level 
uh, series there. So thanks for watching. Please leave a like down below, comment if you haven't, uh, subscribe if you haven't, check out my PayPal, my Patreon, and all of those things you do to support YouTube channels. And as always, enjoy the music.